What's up, guys? This is David, better known as Shelvich to the majority of you, and I'm really excited to share this video, this conversation that I had with Phil from Ashland Leather earlier this week. If you have any questions about anything that we talked about today, if there's anything that you didn't hear today or in this conversation that you'd like to hear in the future, put that in the comments as well. Hopefully this is only the first of many conversations that Phil and I have. Hope you guys enjoy the video and thanks for watching. So like, just a few like quick things like, is shell leather? Like, yes or no, like it's, is it a leather? I think, like, what, what do you think? I think it is. I mean, what Yeah, else? I mean like, isn't it? It's like I feel tan, like if it comes from leather. an animal, if it comes from an animal's hide and you're treating it to be everlasting and flexible and usable and functional, like I would call it leather. So. I don't know. Yeah, also, like, who cares? <laughs> is the other thing. <laughs> like, whatever. But like, isn't like, isn't like, like it? this? Yeah, like, isn't this just like the like horse hide? The, yeah. So that's that's so the the cordovan that uh, the way that Horween produces it, they actually get at the shell from the flesh side. So the side that you're the reverse side is actually the grain side. So that, yeah, that's, you know, that's the it. side where your hair comes out. Uh, but a lot of other tanneries will get at the shell from the grain side. So Horween's oh. specifically, it, it has grain and shell, or other tanneries might not have much uh, grain at all. So I knew that about like Horween because I think like you had mentioned that in a video, but um, I didn't know that like that wasn't. I guess like I didn't know like other tanneries like kind of went like I guess top down instead of inside out to get it. It's like, um, which way are you going to dig at the treasure? You know, you can come from above or from below. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you can get that, in there. It's just hidden in the skin. So, like, on a, I guess the, the next question that somebody had was, uh, like, would you ever, like, split shell to, like, make it I, I, thinner? I, I would consider it. And only because I've seen it done well. Uh, and I've – there's a there's a guy – uh, actually, my buddy Nick Horween sells some wallets made from this guy named Kreis, and he's yeah. out of Germany. He's he will split the shell, and then hmm. back it with a, a non leather backer, sort of glue it on there, and and that has some amazing advantages. Um, the problem and Kreis does it pretty well. It, the problem with the shell in particular is it's very weak, like even without splitting it. But once you start yeah. to like knock the legs out of the shell like and thin it down it's very very rippy like it's paper um so you kind of have to back it with something so i would consider it because i could make a lot more money if i did that uh i don't just sort of like as a philosophical brand concept is i try to stick to just as much of a pure like leather and thread as i can I, I think we kind of have a vibe there. It's like this very like Americana sort of vibe. Yeah. Um, and actually the old, old American stuff is different because they had different glues and adhesives. So if you look at some older, even shell stuff, they had these insane glues that are not even legal anymore for environmental <laughs> reasons that you don't, you wouldn't even have to stitch it. They would just glue everything together. And they're still, I mean, Skip and Nick, Horween still have some of that stuff and it's holding up just fine. So I don't know. There's, there's challenges with splitting it down. I would, I would consider it. Uh, we avoid it because it's not necessarily what we do and it's a little risky, you know, stuff can, yeah. be, and we're trying to make stuff that's going to last forever. So right. I try to do like everything I can to like make that happen. Yeah. So that's, um, so it definitely like makes sense, but I was expecting you to say like, no, so <laughs> It's a good thing. Good thing I asked. Um, the other thing is uh, for dot like I think we probably like touched on this, but like dying shell cordovan. So like obviously like it gets dyed at the tannery or painted at the tannery, but like is there any reason why like a shoemaker couldn't dye it themselves afterwards or shouldn't? Um, the reason they can do it and it's been done and it's being done right now. Uh, Rancourt does that and they make their own colors. Yeah. Um, a reason to not do it would be is if you're bad at finishing and maybe bad at color matching. Like I wouldn't do that. It's it's more work. So right. the idea really is, you know, the reason that Horween does it is so you don't have to. If you're a shoemaker, they're just going to save you the time. 
and then you put it on them to say like hey i need this color the same hopefully every time right and then they can use their skill set to to achieve that for the shoemaker um but there's not a reason i mean you could do it, it you could do a lot of stuff but it's sort of like they're probably better at making it like i'm visualizing somebody like alden is probably better at making a shoe than they are at finishing a shoe yeah so i would like stay with what they're good at you know and right just like outsource everything else yeah no i mean that, that makes sense and like so i have uh i had a pair from um like antonio macariello and uh and he it was natural raw and he like did like the patina himself on it um i think i may have like sent you a picture of it but uh yeah so like i like obviously like i thought it was like fine like there are some uh some folks that said like the dye or like the chemicals in the dye like weaken the shell but like no if you i guess like if you use like the wrong or you use like um just like bad dye like maybe it could but like the point you know so i should say if there's anybody here that's a crafter uh the the one thing to caution would be uh that you sort of just kind of stumble across is temperature so you, you don't want to use like super hot dyes because yeah. the the veg is it will cook when you get above like 120 130 degrees for a while it, it will change the leather it, it started to get really cracky um so i would avoid heat um but pretty much like any dye you could you could stain stuff you could paint it too yeah i would say that makes sense and i think like the uh, the temperature thing um I don't know everything like you're talking about like like veg tan leather like i've heard like shoemakers kind of like say the same thing and not that they don't like using it but it's just more of a pain to work with it's hard yeah yeah um it also has a poor uh, maybe you can tell me this other than cordovan which is unique i feel like the veg stuff has a pipier sort of course break um like i love love the way that the battle stuff uh, like the grandstones using doing yeah. well with i, I love that. the way that looks I, I do feel like it gets a little loose and even my baby i love dublin it i noticed the break is different like it, it sort of creases in a different way that uh i kind of like it on the dublin but i've seen some like more sh like traditional type of veg be very sort of loose that i don't dig i don't yeah. know what's your what's your sense on that so uh more likely to probably like have those types of characteristics or have those like show through on a shoe. Whereas like, like there's some like, uh, like vintage, like chrome tan leathers that are like so super like processed and like glossy. And that's why they're like sought after, but like, like it almost like looks like shell cordobin because it's so like the grain structure is like, so like finally, like, I guess tight. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, so like on the 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 veg tan leather, I think is definitely like more likely to uh, have that happen if it does. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like so like is is hatch green or like the embossed leathers? I guess hatch green is it is that veg tanned or is that I think that's I think I was told like veg tan and like the chrome retan or chrome tan with a veg retan or my. I'd have to see Making what that. you're talking about, but, but because the term hatch grain sort of just refers to a, a texture and you can, I'll give you the long story. <laughs> so hatch grain, the texture can be impressed into any right. leather. You know, we can do hatch grain yeah. shell, you can do hatch grain chrome cell, you can do hatch grain calf. Um, the term hatch grain actually is, is super neat because it comes, the idea of where it comes from is really neat. Yeah. So if you t if if you take your shell, actually, I don't have anything remotely like leather down here. <laughs> but if you take I, your I'm... if you if you take a piece of leather, I'll try to describe it really well. <laughs> but if you take a piece of leather and I've got the grain side pointing up towards the ceiling, and I fold it in on itself, like this, yeah. sort of sort of like make a taco. And if you press one side of the taco down, um, you press it down against the table, and then sort of pull against itself you're sort of rubbing the grain against the grain it creates that pebbling effect so if you if you it's called boarding this process so you can board the leather in one direction to, to create this sort of like shattered pattern which uh, is one direction of the hatch grain and then do it again but perpendicular to where you were and then you, you sort of board it in that direction that that's called we call it a box board or a hatch grain they're sort yeah. of the same uh two words mean the same thing 
Um, but that's where that hatch grain came from is this, it, they used to do it all by hand and they would hand board the stuff. You, you can do that cross board with the two and Skip Horween, every time I go over there, he's always hand boarding and like giving me a little samples. You, you can do like a six way board and like do all sorts of different patterns. Um, but that's what hatch grain is. You, you can do hatch grain on anything except shell, which doesn't really crease at all. So you have to print it into that. A lot of the hatch grain stuff that you might see these days, especially if it's mass produced, is printed. But there are people that do the hand boarded uh, hatch grain box board. They can do that on most everything. Yeah. So like I never. So like I knew like it could be like done on like different leather types, but I always thought like everything was like embossed. Like I didn't wasn't thinking you you of like the hand. board, which is like makes sense as to like why. It's, it's called old, like box board. That's super, and we're we're actually thinking about getting into that a little bit. It's super old world, uh, like hand finishing. Yeah. So a lot of those guys, these are, you think of like a old timey woodworker. A lot of like hand finishing with just like a cloth that you would dip into some stain or something, and just sort of like rub it against the wood. A lot of these old, old finishing things that, that I've heard of, you, you would sort of do that hand box boarding. You board it in those two directions. So you get the chatter mark this direction and then sort of the chatter mark down and it sort of crosses everything and looks like little squares. And then what they do is they take, and the leather guy would finish just the tips of that pattern. So you take a damp rag or whatever and just sort of wipe it over the top and you get this really cool uh, two-tone effect. So you get this darker in the peaks and then like a lighter color valley. So in something like a shoe, when you last that around, it looks insane. It, it just has this, um, that sort of same pattern, but you don't feel it as much. It's not sort of a, a feel texture. It's more of like a visual texture. That's really neat. So I think yeah. you might, you might see that around some places. Same, like, I guess tannery or the same style. So like if it's, I think like there's like the pioneer, like hatch, um, and like same, like colors or whatever, like different makers, like it always like comes out it always like the end result always looks like a little bit different. And like, you, I'm really impressed that you've seen the Pioneer. Where did you see that? Um, so I think the European stuff, maybe. I think it was a Japanese shoemaker. Mm. And it's like uh, a really, uh, I remember making that the tannery, but we didn't make a lot of it. And I think it was made to rip off the sort of like Russian, you know, reindeer stuff. I got, got a little distracted or a little like sidetracked here, but I, was, I just got like my first pair of that. The smell of that, the smell of the, uh, the actual Russian stuff? Baker. No, like the Baker replica Russian reindeer. Like, I don't yeah. know if it's like birch oil or like teak oil or like, it's some, it's like a very distinct smell. Like, it's like not it? like bad. It's not like super pleasant, but it's just like <laughs> You're really to be like. diplomatic. No, it, no like it good. is. Like, Are you ready for me? Yeah. So you, were, you were talking about different methods in shoemaking and why they may or may not matter. And sometimes people can get caught up in those details um, where they kind of don't matter. So one of the examples that I give is I guarantee for everything forever. So I have a strong incentive to make the best product I can um, because if it breaks, I'm going to fix it for free. And I have right. a lot of people that ask me, well, hey, why don't you hand stitch this wallet? And uh, people inherently think that is better for some reason and I'll ask them why they think it's better and they don't really right. have a, a good response. So in that example, it's like, it sounds good that it's hand stitched. And actually I like, I like both. Like I just, I think it's a look and a vibe. Um, it's a chunkier look, uh, on something like a wallet. Uh, it's actually harder to machine stitch and to like get your settings right on the machine and make it look clean and nice. It's much more, skillful to do on a machine it's much faster it's probably easier uh, uh in terms of skill to hand stitch something and slower but it's a it's a vibe right like it if you can't really tell the difference then i don't know why it would really matter um so in the shoemaking examples i, I know you probably don't want to get too detailed to like throw some brand under the bus but uh. sometimes like it's a story that's exciting and like makes you feel really good you know yeah and like so like i guess like the the comparable piece to uh, like 
shoe making is like the the uh components of like the goodyear welt versus like hand welted there's there's fewer layers in like a hand welted shoe um because like you don't need to account for the uh like the tolerance of a machine to do it so there are like other benefits than just like somebody doing it by hand so like do you think like i didn't know that do you think like the the person's like asking because they just like think like or just perceive like a hand stitch is better than a machine or they just want to say like it's hand sewn or like they just don't they don't know so don't get me wrong i don't think there's anything wrong with hand stitching a wallet i think it's cool i think it's both are neat i think people have been told uh that you want a hand stitch wallet and then nobody really says why they said well you better get a hand stitch one so one of the examples i would use is you know Viberg makes a pretty fine boot they're not hand stitching like so people will tell me well if you're using shell cordovan you should hand stitch it and i, I say well, why and they say well it's better <coughs> and, and that's sort of not always the case yeah it's sort of just a preference thing so I didn't know. So that on the shoe, you're saying a hand hand welted is like maybe just a thinner profile. Um, what's the so like with a Goodyear welted shoe, it has the, uh, uh, I guess like the actual like welt is attached to the insole, but the uh, there's like a a linen ribbing or gemming or gemming that actually like connects those two, and then there's, um, just like not thicker but there has to be like more spacing to like allow like the machine to like stitch oh, to, that weld to on get in there and do like the welding mm. so like the uh, gap between like the insole and like where your outsole is like it's like filled with cork is like a larger gap um so it's like overall thicker but the material is like there's less material that's actually like creating it Whereas like it's getting filled in with like the cork, um, yeah. where it's like hand welded, like the bottom of the insole, that is just it's carved out of that instead of anything being attached oh, to it. I see. So they're just like carving it out of the insole, and stitching the welt directly to the right. insole instead of to uh, like a linen rib, and then gluing it. So is it but functionally different? I think like functionally. If you took the best best of both people, you know, is there a functional like reason to do one over the other? So I I think they're both like. So the functional reason is like there's glue that's like a main component in Goodyear welded mm -hmm. that is holding like the linen rib to it. So like there's kind of a uh, potential for like a failure point there. Whereas right. like if you're like carving it directly out of the leather insole. That makes and stitching sense. it directly there, there, like there's no failure point there. Yeah, is that something that fails like often? No, but like I haven't had that. Right, so like it's not really. Yeah. Okay, so you're splitting hairs. Yeah, I mean, like that's like the uh, if there was a functional benefit, like that's where it would be. I like see. you, got, you can definitely like feel, or at least I can feel like a little bit of a difference wearing like a hand welded shoe, but like most of the benefits that I like enjoy out of it. It's like they can do like kind of more like refined work on it. It's really funny that that's sort of the opposite in the, in the shoe, to me at least. You, you can make really, really fine hand stitch stuff uh, on wallets and small other goods also. You tend to see it be like a little bit more rugged. They tend to use like thicker threads. So it's interesting to me that a hand stitch or a hand welted shoe tends to be more refined where like you tend to see more hand stitched wallets look like less refined in my my opinion and again yeah. like you've i've seen incredibly fine hand stitched wallets and stuff too so it's just interesting that uh we're perceiving it uh, for two different like a wallet and shoe world are kind of opposites there yeah and here's here's something that i think we're going to find interesting that we might disagree on i one of the most fr a frequently asked thing of me is can you please make me a wallet with really thick leather and I, I'll say, yeah, absolutely. I'll pick the thickest possible. But I'll usually have to explain to them that I actually prefer the thinnest possible for a wallet. But there's also this, I think, a misconception that a thicker leather is somehow better. 
Um, is that some something that you feel like in the shoe world is true? Um, so I th I think it. <clears throat> excuse me. I think it, for me, I think it depends on the leather. So like if it's a leather that is, um, I guess like one of the characteristics of the leather is that it's a more robust leather than like it should be. If it's a, like a more like refined dress uh shoe or boot leather then like it's okay for it to like be thinner so like i think i don't think like there's a cut and dry answer to it i think like it really, really okay. depends on like what what it is and like if it's uh like suede like i don't really like when they like like split suede like i'd rather it be like a full like reverse suede mm -hmm. so that would be like thicker but that doesn't always mean that like a full like reverse suede from like one tannery maybe like superior or sorry inferior to like a, re, a split suede from somebody else just because like the raw material is like that's actually a different. really good example so like so you can make pretty pretty refined splits and yeah thinner. so like i'd rather have yeah. like the full but like i wouldn't i'd rather have the better raw material than like i say full do you, do you own any vibergs I don't. Okay. I've like so thought about it a few times, but they're thick. Yeah, I've heard. I've, you can you can tell like when you everything when you thick, look bro. at them. Like the midsole is thicker than most outsoles, I, leather outsoles that I see. They're just like everything is thick and firm, which is like I think I think they've changed their way recently, like with what Brett has been talking about. But the the stuff that I've worn and, and stuff that my buddy nick has is like really really thick and uh they feel like tanks and i think the idea from them is that they want something that's going to mold around your foot but it's like pretty brutal to <laughs> to break it yeah it's, it's not pleasant for months so that's yeah so i mean like um i guess i'm wondering where like like why people why so many people are coming at me with with the request for extra thick yeah, I mean, I don't know, but I was going to say, like, so, like, this is, this is, like, the first boot that, like, came to mind, like, when you, like, were just, like, describing that, because, like, this is a, uh, this is, uh, like, been, like, Peabody Kudu and mm. AB Box Calf, and uh, this is made by, like, Antonio Meccariello. It's, so he's, like, a really, like, refined, like, dress shoe maker, mm. but, like, he wanted to, like, go crazy with this for some reason, and it's, like, super robust, but, like, the actual, like, like this is no like the thickness of this is no different than like any of the, his like regular like dress shoes. It's just a more like robust kind of like bottoming and everything. But oh, with the lug soles too. That's yeah, like a cool crossover sort of. Right, vibe. but like wearing it, like it just feels like a dress shoe. Weird. So like That's it's not neat. like any thicker, and like it, it's I, I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite boot, but it's like I've probably worn it the most like this winter out of all my boots. It looks um, like the instep is really high. Yeah, I mean, his... So, like... Yeah, I mean, I think, like... And this is something, like, I think I found, like, really interesting. Like, because I, like, talk to him, like, pretty, like, often on, like, WhatsApp. And he's, like, a... I guess, like, a classically, like, trained or, like, schooled, like, shoemaker versus... Mm -hmm. Not that... So, like, I, I assume, like, there's, like, apprenticeships. And, like, people just, like you know learn the skill but like he went to like years and years and years of schooling and trained under apprenticeships and everything like after that and like i think he like just ha is on like another level of like thinking about like designing and like the anatomy of the shapes of his shoes mm -hmm. to where like you can like see when I, yeah like yeah. when i like wear this like like the my foot's like not restricted at all or my ankle and like I've never had that on any other boot. Like my ankle was like always felt like a little restricted, like when the boots like breaking in. But like huh. this is just, and it's like with most of his shoes, and I'm sure like there are a number of other like kind of like classically like trained or like schooled like shoemakers. But I think like sometimes like people don't like what's the right don't give that aspect like enough 
respect or like kind of pay that like like that's really like translates into why like that shoe may be better or why mm-hmm. getting that type of shoe may be better whereas talking like, about other, like the the designs of the last yeah are like an afterthought for some people maybe yeah like i mean like it's just like if you like look at and i don't i mean i i love all of his shoes but like i'm just using him as the example because that's what i'm holding but like when you uh, like everything about like this like toe like curl or toe spring like is designed so like there's only like one crease whereas like if it's completely flat like as you like roll like you're gonna ripple it and like when you like look at other shoemakers and you like wonder like why is crease like a y shape or whatever right and it's like well why is v yeah like how how does he always or you always see like his shoes and like it's always like a very like clean crease but then you see like other shoes and it's like and it's just like things that like he's just and not just him but i think like people that are kind of more than just like learning the skill but like have like a lot of like training and schooling and like not just how to do it but like why Mm -hmm. and like what are the different parts and how do you like put all those parts together to make like the best like result functionally and like aesthetically like sometimes just like kind of you nailed it with yeah it's It's like why would you like a uh, simple detail. I, I, I think you're a little fancier than your taste is much better than mine. <laughs> and, the, the, and especially in the shoe world. But like, I like, um, like, I like the grant zone stuff. And just one example is like, why, why do we place the speed hooks a certain distance? You know, like let's make them farther apart. And I don't, I didn't actually ask them this specifically, but I found it great as I wear a lot of Aldens and the speed hooks are really close together and I find it hard to like hit the right ones when I'm lacing up and then the grandson ones are separated farther out. So it's like, I wish more people would ask the why and, and then like act on it. <laughs> like it's yeah. just a stupid example, but it makes a big difference to me. Yeah. I was going to say like, I'm now you got me like looking, see like, but yeah, I mean, I, I think like there are just like design elements that some sometimes like you, not like they're just like not giving her due because like i think like sometimes they're just like passed over and just being like oh well that's just like how it's done but like yeah I'm pretty sure like men- most of these like shoemakers including like grant stone and and alden like just there was a reason like they eventually like or, or like did it at the beginning and maybe like it's not as clear now but um yeah it's certainly think, with the, the case of alden them being so old um, yeah they yeah. probably just had a, a way that they did it and they just kept kept going right i mean i think like it's just it's sometimes um especially like nowadays and i don't know i say nowadays i've only like been like <laughs> kind of like collecting or kind of in this like shoe world for like a few years but yeah. um one of the biggest things like i've i've noticed is there's like this good like there's the shoe range of like kind of like five hundred dollars and like below and then like there's usually like a large jump to like 2000 yeah, yeah like yeah. like carmina or like alden it's like a 400 hundred dollar shoe but like if you get it in shell it becomes a thousand dollar shoe because the material but like it's still like a four or five hundred dollar shoe like With without the fa- the material. fancy material yeah. yeah um but then like there's this kind of like mid-tier where it's like we can give you all the details and everything like you want to say that you have of that like fifteen hundred dollar shoe at like 700 but like it's so it's like you can get like the fancy waist and like the fancy looking sole but it's not like you know it's not like the act like as well as all those parts don't come together as well as like the fifteen hundred dollar shoe and i feel like that's so like common and there are so many like makers out there like doing that today that like people are more worried about like saying like i got like a handmade shoe as opposed to like being able to spend that same amount of money and I get see. like a factory made shoe or a Goodyear welded shoe that's mm-hmm. like better, but like they'd rather be able to like you kind think of like have like the uh, the brand name. You have a no, I th- it's more. I think it's just that hand welted or like um, fiddle back waist or like whatever those different like kind of like selling points are now. Like that's mm-hmm. what people are like after some 
Some are. I mean, this is a high level version of, of the things that bother me about how people have traditionally sold leather. <laughs> Uh, like if you watch a car commercial, they might say like, "Oh, these have fancy aniline leather seats," and it's like nobody knows what that even means. <laughs> like, so why? But they go like, "Yeah, like check out my new, like." Th they want something to be able to show their buddies and tell them the story to to like feel yeah. like, awesome, right? So like, look at my. I've, I don't even know what a fiddle waist is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, like but it's like, hey, look at my fiddle waisted boot. You know, like, and then the guys would be like, what does that mean? And it's a way for them to flex on their buddies. Right. I mean, it's just like having like that narrow, like. Oh, right, right, right. Where Which like, is, uh, it's a cool look to be yeah. honest. Yeah. And like, you can't like get that like in a Goodyear wallet shoe just because like, I, I mean, like, you can, but. They like carve like, factory, it out, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like they're actually like, I guess like they build the sole up and then like they car, they shape it back down. Um, and like that does it, there's like a functional like support to that, but I feel like there are many makers that are like doing it now, like super inexpensively and, uh, it doesn't, it just like the, some of the parts just don't like come together that well. I see. So and, well, let me ask you this. It, it, if there was something that had, it checked all the boxes for you, it was like your absolute dream does it matter what the price tag is like yeah i mean like eventually you run out of money right but yeah let's say it was like you could afford it but it was twice the cost of like something else that was also nice but it was like the perfect one like i i, I the older i get the less stuff i have and then i notice like i just want like the one perfect one and i don't care like i'm not going to spend whatever like ridiculous amounts but like it i will pay a premium a high premium yeah. for like the one perfect one yeah just, um, and just be done with it <laughs> yeah like yeah. and I, I mean we were talking about this before but like with like the microphone and like the audio and like cameras like at first like um and the same thing with like shoes or uh computer like it's i've and i got into the point now where like i've recognized it so i like kind of skip that first step but if I'd rather just save up and get what I like really want, as mm -hmm. opposed to being like, I know like that's what I, that's what I really want, but I'm going to try and get that from like that person at half the price. And like, I know like that, is, that like half the price option isn't going to actually be the real thing. And I'm still going to want, or not the real thing, but you know what I mean? Just consuming more and mm -hmm. uh, I'm still going to want the, one that I really want it. And it's just yeah. going to like end up costing me like three or four pairs to like get to that. So like, why not just like save up and just get the one. Yep. And that's, I've kind of like applied, tried to apply that, um, to everything else where it's like, if, uh, like with the a camera or a lens, like instead of just like trying stuff out, like I like I've started like running stuff. So like I can like actually oh, yeah. see if I Smart. like like it, and then if I'm like it, and then I'll just like save up and get like the one that I really want. Pay the premium. I think, yeah, I think like sometimes like it takes more time and effort to figure that out though, mm -hmm. because if you don't actually know like what it is that you want, or like what that product can do and like why, whether it's a shoe or a, uh, just like a leather or some type of technology, like you have to invest the time to like know what you want and know like how do you find out if you're actually getting what you want i, I love that you were saying the why question and, and the funny thing is is i've noticed please tell me if you echo this and a lot of my friends have echoed this uh sometimes the the research process is maybe more than half of the fun because it's pretty it's like uh certainly you know i like the leather stuff but i have some bass guitars behind me and it's it's pretty fun to look at all the different finishes and the different makers and different woods that they use and like it's pretty exciting and then there's this this also this moment of when you put your order in like how exciting it is to like to anticipate it coming yeah like that i like that i mean it's a value out of zero but it's pretty fun so there's yeah. something about the like that process of the research to to like add to cart and then waiting for it to be delivered 
that I like a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. It's so, yeah, I don't know what that means, but, uh, the research is fun and, and I think it, it benefits a company, probably a lot of the people that a lot of the boots that you're buying, it benefits me because people stumble across me. I, I don't advertise for, for my stuff. So I think people researching leather find some value in a YouTube video I might make about Chrome Excel. And then now I have a fan. You yeah. Know? So it helps, it helps me. Um, but it's also, I, I like it too. <laughs> I like just yeah, being a total dork about a thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's what sometimes like, I feel like that is, and I mean, I, I get, I'm uh, sure like not as many as you do, but like, I get like a lot of like questions about like shell cordovan and, and just like shoes or boots, and leather in general. And uh, then like, they always like ask like, how do I like, or how did I like learn or like what book did I read? And I'm like, it. I didn't like read anything what school to be did you go to? like I just like um just like connected with people like you or like these different shoemakers and uh, genuinely like interacted with them to the point where like I was able to like ask them questions and um have like conversations with them outside of like the ordering process right um to where that also like makes that ordering process a lot more like unique and kind of like special to where you're learning about the materials and you can like kind of convey what the end result is that you want and then figure out together like how to how to get that and mm -hmm. I think like I mean I definitely did as well I think probably early on but I think there's kind of a uh an extreme of like everyone wants to go like super deep dive into it and then there are some people that are just like looking for like the shortcut to like how do I like get that information or like, where's that like secret video at? And like, it's not yeah, like yeah. a secret book or video. Like you just have to kind of like put in the, the work as far as researching it, I guess. Well, I mean, you were super smart to just reach out to people because I think that's a secret that people don't realize, especially small guy like me. Uh, I'm going to answer every single person that messages me. And the best part is, is, I know enough uh, to to lead you into a good direction. So basically, like, if you were to... I don't know who the shoemakers are that you're big fans of, but if you reach out to them to say, like, make me, like, or tell me what you think is the best thing, they're probably going to put you down the right path because they're not yeah. going to try to make something that they're not, not great at, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the big secret these days, especially with all the different small brands, is just, like, contact the owner. They'll probably respond to you and then tell or like ask them what they what, that you should order from them and they'll put right. you in the right direction yeah and i think like we probably even like had like a few like different conversations or discussions about like either uh like different like products we were like talking about whether it was like something like uh i don't know like the vertical bugs or um like a nato strap for like an apple watch or like something where like um you like want it but like just as like the uh as like the craftsman, like either knowing that like, it's not like quite like ready or like, it's not really like going to perform like the way like you would want it or like I would want it mm -hmm. to like give you like that honest answer and just be like, like, just wait, like we'll figure it out or like we'll kind of like um, find out like another solution, um, mm -hmm. especially with like shoemakers, like a lot of them, especially a few that like I work with, like they like won't they like wouldn't sell me shoes at the first point at the beginning, unless like they knew exactly 100% they would fit. And I was like a little I mean, annoying. Great. Right. It was like annoying for me. I was like, I just want, I want this, like, I want to buy the shoe, but like, they were like, they're sick of returns, man. They were like, why do you want that size? And like, it was like, um, <laughs> the why it was question annoying. again, right. That's it was great. annoying, but like, it like was like great because like, every single pair of shoes like i got from both of those makers like fits perfectly and i think they just genuinely know like if you get a pair of shoes and it doesn't fit you're not going to get a second pair from them right and maybe that first pair is coming back yeah whether it's the customer service piece or just like the the level of like care i guess and like passion that like the the owner like like you have like it just makes it a lot different i mean that's probably a lot different the, experience that's probably the best thing in a not great 
world that we live in. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm not super young and I'm not very old, but I still remember like where you would have, like for a simple example, you would have a pharmacist that you would like have a relationship with. <laughs> you, you go to your, your guy, doctor, whoever, yeah. and he's a pharmacist in your neighborhood. <laughs> And I actually worked at one of those pharmacists, which is why I'm picking this example. But these days it's like, you don't have like a shoe store. Like you don't have a guy that you know that you trust, but we have easy access to many guys and girls that you can trust and, and have these conversations with. Yeah. So it's, it's, I guess that's an amazing thing about the age that we live in is so much information too. Yeah. It's um, like, I've never, the, uh, I don't know if it's like ironic or not, but like I never, since I've like got into like shoes like this, never had like my foot actually like measured or been in a shoe store. Like all the really? shoes. Not even like, like a, a Brannock device? No. Never. It's been like, I mean like when I was like younger. This reminds me of a conversation I had. I actually think it was with the guys from Grant Stone. They, they were saying that the Brannock device is part of the story that I've been describing where you go into the store and it makes you feel great. Like this guy's taking care of me. He's measuring my foot, but like just put the shoes on and try them and see if they fit. (laughs) It's like, right. That's, that's the only way. Yeah. And it's like one of the like toughest things, I think understanding size, like sizing. And I think like, I remember like, I think you had like, uh, I forget who you were talking to like a different couple of different like sizing discussions about shoes with, with some folks um probably the alden guys and yeah oak street yeah and i think like matt from like Ald- aldwine yep. yeah i always like butcher that name and i think matt just like makes fun of me for it but um <laughs> we'll be making fun of you later tomorrow yeah so like <laughs> it's aldwine <laughs> aldwine aldween <laughs> either one it's like the brand activ- it's like two-dimensional so it's just like a length and a width but like that look at that arch right and there are so or many the- different like in step yeah and there there are so many parts of that where like if you have like a better like arch support the shoe doesn't need to be as wide because like if your like foot's flat it's like wider but then like if it gets like lifted up like it's not as wide all of a sudden because it's like supported but like you can't like i don't know if like that makes like the brand device like useless like i don't think it does but like it's a starting point there's only so many things that you can do besides either trying it on or some like more advice out, I guess. I'm still, I'm still having problems with sizing and I've had the real pros work with me. I think what it comes down to, like you said, you just got to try it on, but like all the lasts are a little bit different. So it's like, regardless of the Brannock measurements, like some of these lasts are going to fit in different ways. And the leathers too, that's the other thing. Dude, people don't understand like in the example that I'm thinking of, I have a pair of India boots from Alden in brown Chrome XL that are probably a full size too small for me, technically. Like if you were to compare it to like what other people are doing off Brannock, but they're my most comfortable pair because they've molded around my foot. And yeah. that Chrome XL is just like stretchy enough to, to fit perfectly. So they're like wearing slippers now. So I still struggle with sizing. I don't, I don't know how to overcome it. Like I wear anything from like a UK seven to a UK eight, <laughs> but like, and like it, the size is just like a number. Like if you like compare the shoes next to each other, they're like still like the same length, basically, whether it's a UK seven from like one or like the UK eight from somebody else. Mm. That's just like how they like translate that measurement into a size. And if I think the biggest thing is until you like actually feel the right fit, you don't like know like what it is. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Is like how I've never really understood what it should feel like, right? Because like, yeah, you don't have an inherent knowledge of what a shoe should feel like, but right. it's supposed to like just hold you in, right? Hold you in place. Generally speaking, like your foot like shouldn't move anywhere. Like your heel should be like secure and. Uh, like when your like foot like presses down, like the uh, like the ball of your foot shouldn't like expand over like the well or like outside of where like the base of the shoe is. See on those on those. Sorry to interrupt you. The most comfortable pair I have, my 
the leather is going way over the welt. What's wrong about that other than it looks stupid? Uh, <laughs> is, so, I mean, I think, thing? I think like the biggest thing is like if you're like if your foot like comes down and like expands like outside of it, yes, it's just like your foot is. So I think the issue could be like your foot could be like sitting on the welt and like could just cause you discomfort. Oh, I see. But like if that's not happening, then you know that it's not necessarily an issue. But I think like that's also just like kind of. Um, it looks weird. Yeah, like a sign of like does it fit or not? <laughs> but I think like oh, there's like a lot of mis not misconceptions, but like. Um, is there like a huge gap in the lacing or is the lacing like overlapped and like there are so many things that cause that that like that's again like one aspect but like just because there's a gap in the lacing doesn't mean that they're not the right size that's funny that you said that's one i've heard too uh, yeah sorry yeah i i I've, that never really made sense to me but i guess it's a look right like they don't want it to look too cinched up and like too open it should yeah. be like just right I think it's also more prevalent that people see what other people's shoes look like. Whereas however many years ago, it was just like, you just got the shoes. You weren't like posting them or like sharing them with anybody. You didn't have so, an Instagram account with yeah. uh, 40,000 people following. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it all contributes to it, but I think like ultimately, like if I wouldn't worry about the number, if the shoe like fits and it's comfortable and it's not like your foot's not moving around, it's probably like, it's probably the maybe not the best fit, but it's probably the right size. Could you imagine being the shoemaker though? It's like that's their whole job. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, but they just like I'm sure like you know like every inch and like how many like cards can like fit in like one of those like card slots. Yeah. Like they like I they just I think they probably like know um generally like what if your foot is tell me like how long it is and like how wide it is here. And like, we have like a starting point. Yeah, man. Uh, Sizing's a, a, a freaky thing to me. Um, I won't say who it is, but I know that there are footwear brands that get more than 30% of their shoes sent back to them. And we sell belts, which are, you know, there's five holes on it so there's pretty good distance for a belt to move but even then like people don't read the sizing instructions and we get a lot of belts back so i can't imagine having 20 styles in 50 colors and then a hundred si i don't know how many sizes these guys have but like ellen yeah. that's, that's like such a logistical nightmare like, I don't know how you run a business. Right. People don't understand. Like, I think most of the, the stuff that we like, I think is like dramatically underpriced. <laughs> it's like, should be way more expensive for the amount of like returns and how much inventory they have to have. It's crazy, man. Yeah. Like I was, I was listening to like the, I think you were having like a similar conversation with Ben about, um, trying to find like, sh like, uh, I think like employees or like shoemakers that he was talking about yeah. for like different like boot companies. And I think it's just, like all of those like factors kind of like co like contribute to uh, whatever the price is and like people are always like complaining about the price or the result to where it's like this is not like perfectly like executed like every single stitch like everywhere I, like i need like a refund and a new boot and it's like oh, well wow. like, you can't you can't like have like all of that and you have to like kind of understand like what the expectations are of like what it is that you're buying like there's um it shouldn't be like defective but like there may be like small like imperfections throughout like the leather or throughout like just different aspects of it and if you're like if you're just like constantly like returning stuff or just like mm -hmm. abusing it it hurts say abusing it but like you're you're not like making it better at the end of the day that like i guess what i could say about that is like i really want my customers to be happy so like i will it doesn't make me mad to get a belt back to like get them the right size because I want them to like experience and love the leather as much as I do. Like, yeah, I just want it. I want them to love it. So if somebody has this, like a, like a crafting issue too, it's same thing. Like I don't want, like people should understand too. brand like me, other small makers, footwear makers too. 
it's, a, it's like a real person making the stuff. So yeah, things happen. And at the end of the day, we do everything we can to avoid sending out flaws. But it happens. And when people come at me uh, with like, hey, I noticed this. Is this normal for you? And if it's not, I'm going to say, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Let me send you a new one right away. And right. get you a return label in that box. So we take care of people. And I think a shoemaker would do the same thing. But if you come at somebody like, oh, jerk, like I'm not a dude at Amazon or like a, just a faceless name uh like i legitimately want to help so that that's a good guidance for everybody is just like pretend like you're talking to your mom or something like. right like, and <laughs> i think like it's 99 percent of the uh, small like craftsmen whether it's like for like leather goods or like shoemakers or, like they i think they genuinely want to help just like you mm -hmm. described i think it's like the uh, for sure and like the larger companies do as well but um, I think they're more likely to just have like customer service, you know, if you, uh, approach it a little bit more like not reasonable, but just like, Hey, like, yeah, this reasonable. is what I got. Like, yeah. Like what, <laughs> what am like, is this like normal or can you explain like what, like why this happens? Like, what does this matter? Like, is it actually yeah. going to impact the shoe? I think like, it's a lot better than just saying like, Hey, like, I don't like how this looks or like. Yeah. Just be like, yeah, people want to take care of you, but you're yeah. like, I, there's examples where somebody would point out a flaw and I'll give them an option. Like, Hey, look, that's a flaw. It's not going to affect the durability. It's more yeah. like a cosmetic thing. So what I'll tell them is, you know, usually we catch those things in house and we put them into our irregular sales. So what I'll do is I'll just offer you the irregular price, or I can give you a refund completely, or I can swap it out for a, a better one. So yeah, if you come at people, they'll, they'll hook you up. And sometimes, you know, when we when we make a mistake, like I'll send you an extra goodie along back, you know, because like we want to do like we, a brand like me and all the small makers certainly heavily rely on word of mouth. So yeah, it's what's the name of that uh, phenomena where it's the, it's something like a a cockroach in a bowl of candy or whatever like ruins the whole bowl, bowl of candy. But if you flip it the other way, it's like it's a negative bias or something like that. So like, basically if I have one bad review, that's going to spread uh, a lot worse than like a hundred great experiences. Like people yeah. don't tend to like brag about like how great something was. They'll be like, this was awful. <laughs> right? so, yeah. I was, I was just like looking at like, um, headphones online and was looking at the reviews and I saw like one review that was really bad. It and happened. I was like, yeah. I was like, who, <laughs> what happened? And is this like the same like seller or something? But like, to your point, time, we got to like wrap up and definitely like, hopefully like do this again. But like one yeah, other question, I, like, I'll is do it, it again anytime you want. Is it, is it Natty or is it Nacho? <laughs> <laughs> do you want the, the story? Uh, uh, the, the story is that nacho is sort of like a lazy way of saying natural by just like not enunciating the, the words properly. But the person who it comes from is, is uh, one of the employees at Horween who does the final QC and, and sorting and trimming for most everything that they ship out. And he's a Vietnamese man who also speaks Spanish and English. So he speaks better Spanish than English. Basically the guy's like a, a wizard yeah but he, he has this thick vietnamese sort of accent and he he doesn't enunciate natural completely so he says nacho <laughs> so dan <laughs> my business partner always calls it nacho yeah i was gonna say i remember when i like ordered like my, I, I don't know if it was my first or like my second watch trap i was like I, like can you like make it out of like the nacho shell quarter then? Did I think I said something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I told Dan about that. I was like, Dan, you have to stop telling everybody it's called nacho because people are going to get confused. And he's like, whatever, man, it's funny. <laughs> I guess it is. It is kind of funny, but it like creates a communication issue. And I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for giving. Because it makes you feel like a jerk. You're like, oh, I thought like. No, I, don't I was want to have to like, like correct people. Like, honestly, like for me, like. <laughs> the it was a post that he did on that dan had on instagram of like right. and it was so like it was good for me because like i knew how to like identify like those were the exact like 
shells that like I was asking about. Actually, yeah, okay, it worked. But it worked well. But I think like to your point that there are some people like super hung up on like I want like natural or like whiskey or like bourbon or somebody uh, thinks it's a new color. They, yeah, they want like that, but they don't care like what it actually looks like. They just want like the name. And yep. I think like that that's where like it could be like a little troublesome, but like it's a problem. We'll get by. <laughs> we'll figure it out though. All for Dan's sense of humor. <laughs> Hey, but thanks for um, hanging out. Seriously, yeah. anytime, anytime you want to chat, and maybe we can do it from my shop, and I can like show you examples of things. Uh, anytime you want. 